If you can spin it however you want, but at the end of the day, reality matters. And even the World Bank was compelled to put in their handbook that for millennia, gold has been a store of value. It is something to hedge against inflation. And this is happening today. And there is investment demand for gold as a safe haven and an inflation hedge today. What's happening now is that the data is starting to fray. And that causes me to double down on my hard, uh, my hard landing call and therefore, I'm very bullish on gold, particularly silver after a lag. Yes, even Darth Silver, they call me. Even Darth Silver likes silver this cycle. But gold first and foremost now. This year, if I had to choose, I'd go more on gold than silver. Analysts at BMO Capital Markets believe that while gold and silver prices could experience consolidation in the near term, the rally in the precious metals sector is just beginning. In a report published Wednesday, the Canadian bank announced a significant upgrade for its gold and silver price projections for the next three years, with the high watermark in the final quarter of 2024. The bank's commodity analysts see gold prices averaging around $2,169 an ounce this year, up 11% from its previous forecast. Lobo Tigre, the founder and CEO of Louis James LLC, pointed out the World Bank's recognition of gold's ancient lineage as an inflation hedge, underscoring its relevance in today's investment arena. Despite challenging conditions, Lobo is confident that gold will be upheld by ongoing central bank demand and the potential for rate cuts. Gold's record price on March 22 was largely attributed to the Federal Reserve's Open Market Committee meeting that week, in which Fed Chair Jerome Powell confirmed the committee seeks to cut interest rates three times in 2024. At the core of his financial strategy, Lobo states gold as an essential long-term asset for managing economic uncertainties focusing on its capacity as a strategic buffer. Even with the recent downturn in gold stock performance, he holds on to optimism for their future leverage potential. During the last quarter of 2023, the major gold stocks, gold stock ETFs, and smaller gold stocks bottomed and started a more positive trend. Then they returned to weakness in January and February and gave back most of the gains. Barrick Gold is climbing off its 52-week low, which reached February 14th, the day the gold miner gave a mixed fourth-quarter earnings report. Shares rebounded the next day after two analysts kept their outperform ratings on the stock. The gold stock is rising near its downward-trending 50-day moving average. Now, we present the clips of Lobo Tigre's insights from his recent interview with Liberty and Finance. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. I think that's... Uh well spotted and i think that's actually part of the opportunity when i say that i'm focusing on gold i'm not necessarily going down to the coin shop and buying another buffalo every weekend or something um you know i i buy bullion i accumulate bullion whenever i can whenever i have savings to put away I, in that sense i'm a stacker like anybody else that's not a speculation in my view i'm not buying it because i think the price is going up i'm buying it because it's gold and, you know, if things get really bad, it will still be gold and I'll still be able to use it. If the Internet goes down, you know, my memory drive with all my other wealth might be useless, but my gold will still be liquid. So don't don't confuse that with an investment thesis. That's just you know an, an always on savings principle that I have. So when I say I'm focusing on gold and uranium this year, I mean the stocks. I'm buying those to speculate on hockey stick potential. So to your question. You'd think with gold at record, you know, record, nominal record all-time highs, by the way, a real all-time high would be north of 3,400, and that's just using the CPI. If we use shadow stats or something else, it would be, you know, <laughs> twice as much. I don't even want to say the number out loud because it sounds crazy, but, you know, 3,400 is actually just the 1980 peak adjusted for the government's own statistics. If that is where we're headed, the, the stocks should really deliver leverage. And they haven't been lately, they've been underperforming, which has some people pulling out their hair, saying, oh, I give up, I'm disgusted, blah, blah, blah. Darkest before the dawn again. I actually think that's the opportunity. And I, I understand, I think I understand why it's happening. In gold spikes in the past, in 2011, even 1980, there's spikes and it comes crashing right back down again. And 2011 took a while. I mean, the spike didn't last long, but then it was still like over 1900 was intraday. Around 1800 lasted for a while, but then it fell off of a cliff that just didn't stop hurting gold bugs for five years, five long painful years. 
Uh, so I understand that that's not just recency bias. That's actually all the history of gold since it was separated from the dollar by Tricky Dick Nixon in, in 71. So if that's what gold has always done when it has gone on a big you know, surge, it's not crazy for people to say, oh, well, the next big movement is downwards. And so I think the gold stocks have actually been leading gold down. But the, but the issue is there is that I think they're wrong. Like it, it would be if if they're right and I'm wrong, gold falls off a cliff next, you know, Bidenomics kisses the boo-boo, we're all fine now, and we don't need no stinking safe haven assets. Never mind the two hot wars that could become World War III going on in the world or anything else. I'm being facetious and maybe I shouldn't. I, I mean, those are real, and that's not something anybody can ignore. But maybe even more important for the gold dollar exchange ratio, which I like to call it rather than the price of gold, because gold is money, so it's a forex question in my view, the gold dollar exchange ratio has done well despite higher interest rates, despite normal headwinds for gold, uh, evidently because of central bank buying. Not in the West, of course. The global South, the East has been buying. You know, even if Team No Landing is right, that's not going to stop central banks from buying. You know, the, the, everybody who had that rude wake up call when the U.S., you know, weaponize the dollar. They're not going to suddenly decide, oh, everything's fine now. We're, we're okay with New York and Washington controlling our financial lifeblood. That's a one-way change. Even there, yeah, it's hard for me to see anything within investable horizons that's terribly bearish for gold. But let's say I'm wrong. I don't see anything. We're still heading into a rate cutting cycle. If nothing else, we're still heading into a rate cutting cycle. And that's always been bullish for gold. Contrary to claims that it's too late for a recession, Lobo Tigre notes that we're currently at the average time since policy tightening, hinting that a recession may still be looming. According to data from Schroeder's, a global investment manager, both gold and gold equities have performed well through five of the past seven recessions in the early 1970s. Looking at the returns from six months before the start of the recession to six months after the end, we can see that gold has returned 28% on average and outperformed the S&P 500 by 37%, a recent report read. Meanwhile, Lobo's optimistic view primarily focuses on gold and silver, with uranium also standing out due to its resilience in the face of recessionary pressures. With the influx of new buyers into the market, Lobo perceives a positive trend. He regards the disparity between gold prices and gold stocks as a potential investment opportunity. Let's get back to the interview. Dark is before the dawn. This is that dark period where the other side is claiming premature victory. I'm absolutely convinced that's wrong. And even, sorry, one more thing. My friend Adrian Day likes to point this out and give credit where due. He's absolutely right about this. The average length of time between policy change and the impact on the economy, particularly tightening and the recession, the average length of time is about where we are now from after when the policy tightening happened. There are different numbers I've seen ranging from 18, typically 24, a high of 27 months, which would be like this June. Never mind the the media parroting the same phrases or these other things, just just that one number. That's the, the main question, you know, recession or no recession. And all these people saying, if we haven't had one by now, we're not gonna have one. That's just simply incorrect. The history of recessions is that we're just now getting into the average length. It's not even overdue. We're just at the average length of delay right now. It would begin to be overdue starting in July and later towards the end of this year. If there's no recession by the end of this year, then I think we really could start to lean towards the it's different this time story. But even then, in a post-pandemic, massively distorted economy with all these stimmy checks and all these crazy things they've done, it's possible that even if there's no official recession this year, that it's still not necessarily a done deal. Anyway, the what's happening now is that the data is starting to fray, and that causes me to double down on my hard, uh, res my hard landing call, and therefore I'm very bullish on gold, particularly silver after a lag. Yes, even Darth Silver, they call me, even Darth Silver likes silver this cycle, but gold first and foremost now. This year, if I had to choose, I'd go more on gold than silver. Almost everything else is completely off the table, Dunning. And if, if I'm right, and I may be wrong, but since I, since I think we're headed for a hard landing, no oil, no lithium, even it's on, on sale, no copper, even though I love that for decades to come, nothing else besides gold right now, with the one single exception of uranium, because that 
it's not perhaps entirely immune to a recession, but it's very recession resistant. It's it's a baseload power that you want. In fact, I find it very encouraging that this last week, as you and I are recording, we just had the Fed's decision, and that had a very positive impact. That's what took gold to this latest record, nominal record high. That's not other central banks. Other central banks weren't waiting for the Fed, and they're not buying gold because the Fed did this, that, or the other. They're buying gold because it's not the dollar, and they want to diversify out of their dollar holdings. So I, I think it's really interesting that in this environment where central bank buying has been propping up gold for the better part of a year, now we just saw a new source of buying. Now we saw people who said, holy cow, you know, the, the, the Fed really is pivoting. Even with higher inflation, the Fed is still talking about pivoting. It's stuck by the three, you know, three cuts this year. Barely, but it did. This suggests a new buyer to the market that hasn't been there for a while. And that's very optimistic for me. But anyway, so I'm being long winded again, Dunnigan. But the point is, it makes sense to say, well, gee, why are the gold stocks relatively cheap? Or I would even say absolutely cheap. If you price them in gold, they're dirt cheap. Why are they so cheap with gold at record prices? Well, this is because, as I'm saying, it's not just the recency bias. The history of gold spikes is that it comes down. The so-called smart money in the sector, or the people that even bother with gold at all, have been leading gold down because they expect gold to come off the spike. I think they're wrong. I think gold keeps going north. And when they realize that, the alligator jaws in that chart snap shut with the stocks coming up rather than gold coming down. And I see that as a terrific opportunity, and it is a top priority for me personally right now to put more money into play based on that thesis. City analysts recently noted that the most probable scenario leading to gold hitting $3,000 per ounce is a swift escalation of the ongoing de-dollarization trend among central banks in emerging markets. This shift could trigger a crisis of confidence in the U.S. dollar. How will the shifting landscape of precious metals investment impact your investment strategy in the coming years? Drop your thoughts in the comment section below. If you find this video informative, don't forget to support our channel and turn on notifications to stay informed about our latest videos. See you in the next video.